signs of deterioration and it's vulnerable to risk. Let's look at those numbers. I don't, I'm not sure if you can see that, but the total funding needed is one point, almost $1.4 billion. It's that column there on the right. Right there. $1.4 billion. Okay, what about our local needs? That's really of concern to me as a city councilor. Um, we have a public works department and they do these um, semi-annual reviews and they calculate the investments needed to kind of bring our infrastructure up to an acceptable level of service. Now well, here's Santa Fe's situation. If you look at our total needs, it's about 362 million, but our funding gap is about 238 million. I want to point out, if you look at water and wastewater and parks, those three categories have dedicated funding sources. So you, you can see that the gap between the needs and dedicated funding is not as great as the others. And that is really one of the primary challenges for local governments. What are some of the traditional uh, funding mechanisms? We have general obligation bonds. They require voter approval. It requires an extensive campaign, quite a bit of public buy-in. Capital improvement bonds, uh, you always have a limitation on your bonding capacity because it's usually backed by gross receipts taxes. You have assessment districts, which are, are basically localized taxes for localized improvements. But of course, it's narrowly distributed and it has a limited impact in its effect. Then there's other government agency funding, but it's very competitive. We have uh, major funding categories for water, uh, legislative capital outlay, local government road funds, um, we have traditional loans, and of course we all know about the takedown that, that big banks uh, have on loans, and then we have enterprise funds. Uh, we have the various utility enterprise funds, and basically they're lock boxes. Whatever comes in, let's just say the, wa the water fund is an enterprise fund, but whatever revenues come in, only the expenditures can be made for the water system. And so they're really self-sufficient funds, and they typically do well. They typically do well um, in terms of funding. So what's our call to action? We need to make a renewed commitment to fund infrastructure. We need to explore all options. Uh, we know how the gridlock in Congress has really made it very difficult to fund a lot of America's needs. And so... I think that's, that's our call to action, is stop depending on the federal government and let's empower ourselves and come up with some innovative uh, financing options like public-private partnerships, like public banking. We still need federal investment. Federal, federal funds can help leverage state funds, local funds, and even private funds. Here's one thing that, that that last bullet on the bottom there is, we take a lot of things for granted. You know, we use uh, public transportation, we turn the faucet, we expect water to come out, we want our solid waste picked up uh, on time, and if you look at how those are funded, they're heavily subsidized. And, and I think maybe it's, it's a part of our American culture, but we need to start thinking more about pricing, appropriately pricing the use of infrastructure. And, and I know that maybe we're not ready for that shock treatment, but I think it's a dialogue that needs to begin as well. Um, so, that's, that's infrastructure in 10 minutes. Uh, are we ready to meet the challenge? Yeah. Yes. No, I want to hear it. Are we ready to meet this challenge? Yeah. <laughs> before, I, before I hand over the podium, I, I just want to let all of you know I, I had our staff do a kind of a compilation of total outstanding loans as of June 30th for the city of Santa Fe, the total is 296 million. I'm sorry, that was bonds. Total outstanding bonds as of June 30th, and this is everything, this is general government enterprise funds, 296 million, total outstanding loans as of June 30th, 35.6 million. So you can see that we're investing heavily in a lot of traditional uh, sources, and let's hope that this feasibility study that the city government is initiating will help give us some ideas of where we can 
invest that money possibly in public banking. So I really appreciate your attention and thank you for coming. See, I told you we had a great panel. Our next speaker, Marvin Ginn, is an enrolled member of the Choctaw Nation of Oklahoma. He's executive director of Native Community Finance, which provides financial education, community-oriented affordable loans. They are a BIDA tax site. They're an IDA program, individual development accounts, if you're not familiar with those, and mortgage assistance services. Marvin has over 20 years of experience working in native community housing and economic development. He's on the board of directors for the Housing Assistance Council. He works with the Indian Affairs Department on legislative uh, on legislation preventing predatory lending practices and tax preparation, while serving as a director of tenant services for Laguna Housing Development and Management Enterprise. He developed native community finance with LHGME as the sponsor. And please help me welcome Marvin Zia. Uh, 
ranch that I know of in New Mexico on the reservation is at Dulce, up at Hickory Apache. Wells Fargo has one in, in the uh, uh, supermarket there. But otherwise from that, there's not any. So with public banking, I think we, we can start answering some of those questions as to how we can get access to capital onto the reservation. How can we make that clear? It's not only, I would like to go further, it's not only the reservations, it's the rural areas. And New Mexico is rural. And so this, this follows completely in line with everything because it's not just us as Native Americans, it's all rural communities that don't have access to capital. So how can we get along? How can we start a business? Our CDFIs work to do that, but we don't have the capital to do it. There's not enough funding for that. So, you know, possibly, here we go again, with a public bank, it might be access to capital for the CDFIs to do that. I would like to make a point that it is good business to work on the reservations. I've been in business for eight years. I've made millions of dollars worth of loans on the reservations, and I have written off $1,162 in that eight years. You know, you... It's good business, but people just don't realize it. So, when we do, as we work on this, this uh, public banking, you know, I think it's important that we, we draw everybody in. Let's look at tribal sovereignty. There's ways to do it. There's limited waivers of sovereign immunity for the transaction, which we, we use a lot. But there's got to be more than banks lending for the casinos. We, we need, you know, garages, we need hairstylists, we need uh, cafes. There's all sorts of businesses that could, could uh, benefit by coming onto the reservation. So I, I, I just wanted to let you know that, that we've been working on it a long time. Uh, I know some of my partners are, are here in like West Fork, uh are here, and, and we've all worked on it. And it's just good business. So hopefully we can work together and get this going and, and make a positive in, impact and keep the predatory lenders away. Because when you don't have access to capital, guess who comes in? All the predatory lenders. And I actually bailed a young lady out about two weeks ago that came to me, 719% interest. We don't need that in New Mexico. So, but anyway, thank you. I think I've probably used up most of my time, so thank you, and thank you everybody for coming out on a Saturday. This is great. Thank you. So we have an infrastructure deficit that needs funding for local communities for basic economic development purposes, and we've heard now that our traditional banking system doesn't work very well for native communities. Now we're going to hear from Alejandro Saluca, who consults with Prosperity Works on strategic development, working with underbanked and unbanked populations in New Mexico. Her work related to IT lending is extremely relevant within the Latino market. Originally from Uruguay, Mrs. Ms. Saluba has contributed to the growth of New Mexico through chairing the City of Santa Fe's Immigration Committee, owning and operating three highly successful businesses, serving as Secretary of Rising Stars, and as a board member of the Santa Fe Hispanic Chamber of Commerce, a previous business development director and marketing manager of Water Credit Credit Union, Ms. Saluba gained CDFI or Community Development Financial Institution status for the organization. Please help me welcome our Highness Saluba.
type of alternative services or payloads. So um, in New Mexico, we have about 20% um, underbanked um, individuals. That is about 185,000 people, and uh, unbanked are uh, 85,000. So one of the issues that we see when people do not have a bank account is, you know what Marvin was referring to, well, they have to drive, let's say, 40 miles to cash the check. So they use an alternative service. That would mean that sometimes they pay 10% of the check to get it cashed. If we talk about low-income uh, members of our society getting charged that fee every time they get a paycheck, that really adds up at the end of the month and on their overall budget. Um, another issue is the lack of access to credit. If you do not have an account, uh, and you cannot start building credit, of course, say that you have an emergency, you will rely on a payday loan or a high finance company to get you out of the issue that you're facing because most of the time, because it's a low-income family, won't have um, emergency savings. Um, that goes to the next step, right? You get into the cycle of debt. People, um, try to get out of debt, but talking about 700% interest rate, what they do is they keep renewing that loan and paying fees every time they renew it. I was just talking to Winona, who is the CEO of well, the Credit Union, and was telling me that they were talking to a member that had 14 payday loans. How do you get out of that? Even a financial institution that works uh, to try to get uh, help is like, how do you do it when somebody is in a situation like this? Um, the next issue that we, we see a lot with uh, underbank members are, um, let's say that they want to buy a car, they don't have credit, they go to um, somebody that they know, and they make a private deal. Oftentimes, the car that they buy is a salvage vehicle, or what the down payment is what really the car is worth. So all the extra payments are already paying on a vehicle that doesn't have the value. Um, I think it gets worse when it comes to mobile home loans because we see the same issue, but it is their house. So when they're trying to sell it, they see that the value was never there and they're trapped in that mobile home until they can pay it off. And Let's say that uh, they buy a mobile home for $10,000, it's probably worth $5,000. Uh, and by the time they pay off that mobile home, even less, because it depreciates. So those are some of the issues that we see when um, people that we call unbanked or underbanked um, are not able to get an account in a mainstream financial institution. Uh, with public banking, this is not something that will be directly um, affecting our population, but they will have the community resources back into our community and not like going to big banks in Wall Street. So that is uh, that's what I have. Thank you. funding gap for infrastructure. Traditional banking system isn't working very well for native communities. It's not working very well for the other bank or the younger bank. Hmm. Maybe there's a solution somewhere. Our next speaker is going to talk about his experience in the area of small business. Steve Bissetta is a past director of Albuquerque South Valley Business Development Center and the owner of the Bissetta Group LLC in Albuquerque. He served 16 years on the Burnley County Planning Commission and was the chairman of the board of the Albuquerque Hispano Chamber of Commerce in 2013. He, he began his career at the IRS in 1976 while attending the Anderson School of Business at UNM. In 2011, he was selected as the Small Business Person of the Year by the Albuquerque Hispano Chamber of Commerce. In 2012, he was awarded the New Mexico Champion a collaboration award by the U.S. Small Business Administration. Please help me welcome Steve Pissetta. Well, good afternoon, everybody, and thank you for uh, 
obedience I do. First of all, I'd like to say it's an honor and a privilege to be asked to be on this panel. Uh, and I also want to acknowledge, and I just noticed that uh, Albuquerque City Council and I have been with here in the audience. is in the community that I'm going to be talking about today. Uh, we'll be talking a little bit, we're talking obviously the, the theme is the challenge we need for local funding as it relates to small business. And uh, in my nearly 40 years of working with small business, either on the regulation side as, a, as an employee of return revenue service for 18 years in the region, we remained working as an advocate for small business. Uh, a little bit about the community that uh, I work in and actually in that, in that I live in. Uh, I live in the uh, Albuquerque South Valley, and the community that we're working in is the South Valley, the unincorporated area of Albuquerque. And in addition to that, the city of Albuquerque, uh, what has been termed at times, Aqua Poverty, which includes some of the older neighborhoods, San Jose, where they left Martinez Town, and those those neighborhoods. So that's the community that I'm talking about, which is primarily a poor community. It's, uh, it's uh, predominantly Hispanic. Uh, there's a small, I mean, there's a large presence of small business in that community. Uh, and in that business, in the, in the small businesses that you see there are a lot of service industry and, and retail trade. Now, jobs are provided, obviously, in the community, that, uh, in this community, provided by small business, provided by large business, and provided by government. But I think that you see that the, uh, the majority of that employment is going to be small business, or Main Street, if you will. Uh, banks uh, rarely provide the necessary capital that's needed, and that's one of the things that's obviously, and that's a theme of what we've been talking about here, is the access to capital. That's not a, a new phenomenon, but it's a phenomenon that is just more, uh, it's, it's exacerbated, it's been exacerbated since 2008, and especially for New Mexico since 2010. Uh, but banks, like I said, are rarely going to fund a startup business or uh, the expansion of the business, and so that's clearly the reason that we were here today. Uh, the business uh, that we have, there's about 18,000 small businesses in Albuquerque, in the area of Albuquerque. About 88% of those businesses are going to be employers that have 20 or fewer employers, employees. Uh, in the community that I'm talking about, it's almost 99% small business. So it's, it's obviously something that touches home. Uh, but entrepreneurship is, is a bound in the community, especially in the immigrant community. In, uh, in the South Valley and in, in downtown Albuquerque. Uh, there's, there's an element also of this community that I live in that is buy local. But one of the things that you, that's, there's a force about buying local that pulls away from that, that pulls away from 